What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Made You a Mixtape podcast. On this episode, we are going into the post-production world of television, reality television specifically, with Ace Editor, or ACE Editor, Mary DeChambre. Mary, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. So let fill us in a little bit on your resume and some of the shows that you've worked on that our listeners will have actually definitely watched. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I edit on programs like Project Runway. That's probably what I'm most known for. And uh, I earned an Emmy in 2009 for my work on that show with my team. So I'm very excited about that. Since then, I've worked on shows like American Ninja Warrior. We were also Emmy nominated twice. Uh, so that's been pretty exciting. And uh, it's really that's a fun show to be a part of and, and to be on that team. And then I'm also working actually right now on RuPaul's Drag Race, which I think everyone's heard of that show by now. And so that's been a fun adventure. <laughs> Going through your IMDb resume and just seeing this, the list of reality shows, some of them really kind of stood out. And one of them was MTV's The Real World. And I think about just how much influence. I mean, this is kind of when MTV was gearing away from showing music videos but the real world was still one of those shows that brought a lot of music to the foreground how was it working on that show and how often did you get some of those songs stuck in your head <laughs> oh my gosh i absolutely loved working on the real world and that's actually the show where i learned how to edit i started on that show as an assistant editor and so i was just helping everyone um you know get all their material and that kind of thing and then they would give me little scenes to cut so i could practice and that's really where i, I learned the craft and i can't imagine a better show to really learn how to edit on because it was just pure verite footage they didn't really use um I mean, confessionals came into play later, so we do have confessionals, but there weren't really like sit down interviews necessarily. And so what you captured is what you had. There was no second takes. There was no um, doing an entrance over because maybe the cameras weren't in the right place. You had to work with what you had. And so sometimes scenes would go a little longer than we would even cut now um, just because you had no cutaways, <laughs> you know, things like that, just because aesthetically it still has to look good. And then in terms of using the music, what was so great about the real world, and I came on around season 10. So it was when they did the back to New York season. Um, and then not long after that, they did the Las Vegas season, which was pretty notorious and pretty famous for some of the salaciousness of that season. But what was great about MTV at the time is because they were still pushing music. They wanted to push music into the series. And so we had a music supervisor that would work very closely with. And so we would want to have music that was very current, um, very of the moment, some just um was getting promoted by uh you know a label and so they wanted to you know make sure it was included in the series um and those cues were usually some of the fun more fun to work with because they would have lyric we would use them for moments like a, a big montage like going out for the night that kind of thing so they were a lot of fun to play with although i do remember especially back in the early 2000s Whenever we would get like a hip hop or a rap cue, oh my gosh, those guys like to talk over the intros all the time. <laughs> so it was so hard getting any sort of instrumental part of the of those, you know, music cues. You just had to go in hard with the lyrics right away, you know, and just kind of work with them in that way. I stumbled upon a quote earlier today from uh, from the late Philip Seymour Hoffman. And just to paraphrase the quote, it was very much like, Shooting, shooting the production is very much the grocery shopping and editing is where you really make the meal of the show. And you have to think that when it comes to reality TV, that that statement is more true. I think that probably with, uh, you know, when you think about a film, they're probably grocery shopping with a with a shopping list. Whereas reality TV, it's like, eh, let's just get everything and make a buffet. How long does it take to sift through all that footage and to really kind of craft the story from what's there? On a docufollow series, which would be something like, you know, the real world or even the real housewives today, how it's kind of morphed into that. I mean, we could spend anywhere from six weeks for a half hour episode uh, to 15, 20 weeks. If it's a one hour episode, you know, with one editor, sometimes two editors, um, you know, on American Ninja Warrior, that shows a little different in that it's all shot on a stage. 
but even that show, we have 13 to 15 editors per episode at any given time, just because it takes such a massive team of people to put it all together. When it comes to, you know, you mentioned montages and, you know, music as a narrative device. Where where's the the line? Like, how much does music actually influence the edit? Like, obviously, with the montage, you know, the the beat may be what's more, you know, driving of the of the of the, you know, of the feel of or the tempo of it. But then, like, at what point do you sit there and say, well, no, no, the music is a narrative tool as opposed to just a hype piece? Well, for me, when I edit any scene, I want to make it work without music, period. And like, that is my goal and that is my focus. And I want it to just sing and sail and be smooth and flow um, and sound good. I make sure I, you know, like the dialogue, I make sure it's really clean. And I even put in, if there's dead air, I make sure I put in clean dead air, that kind of thing. So for me, that that comes first, and I make sure that there's some sort of um, you know cadence and a, and a rhythm within the scene in that way, right? So then I'll go in and I'll audition music under that and see what fits, um, and just kind of go from there. And so I find the music that accompanies the scene, although some editors do it more the other way around, and it really depends on how important the music is for the scene. You know, sometimes you do start with the music cue if it is a montage, for example. And I know like that's what I've been given from the script supervisor, from the um, music supervisor, and they're like, okay, this is the cue you have to use for whatever reason. You know, the executive producer picked it. It's just what's been chosen. You know, so then obviously you'd start with the music cue there. But for me, the music is secondary. However, it is what absolutely elevates the scene. And without it, you miss it. A lot of times you really do miss it. And I'll, I'll, I tend to edit very wall to wall in, in my scenes, you know, with music really wall to wall. But then when you drop out the music and you have nothing there, like people pay even more attention to that one little moment you know, just because you have dropped out of the music. So there's just, but yeah, I mean, the music is pretty much everything. <laughs> it, it, it's funny you mentioned the wall to wall aspect of music is that it feels almost sometimes uh, when it's not there, like it's almost too sparse. Do you find the music, you know, can get in the way of the story? If I'm finding that the music is, is not, helping if i'm really struggling finding the piece of music for the scene typically the problem's the scene and i go back and i rework the scene you know and so it for me it's a way to realize like all right something's not right here either my emotions are changing to a need to have some sort of like a little connective tissue a little something to kind of ease from you know the or or maybe i want the sharp turn to be really intentional i don't know but generally if i'm finding a scene's not working i'm trying to put the music in it's because the scene's just not working your journey to get to you know emmy winning reality show editor didn't necessarily start out that way because you started out as a public school art teacher how did you get from point a to point b well, it does seem like it's a big jump to go from a public school art teacher, especially to becoming an Emmy winning reality TV editor. But the two jobs actually have a lot in common. I started to learn how to edit in my own classroom. I was given some free software from Avid, God bless them <laughs> for giving us some free software. I was also given a free Adobe suite. So we were working with things like Photoshop and we were doing some web design and, you know, editing was just kind of like one of the other little elements we were experimenting with and playing with um, in my art classroom. You know, it was like the 90s and video was becoming more of a fine art element. And there were actually fine artists who were doing art installations with video. So to me, it kind of justified why we were even learning it in my classroom. <laughs> You know, because we were supposed to be learning drawing and painting and here these kids are making like, you know, hype commercials for the football game that's going to be, you know, this weekend, right? You know, the Friday night game. Um, 
But I just noticed that I completely lost all track of time when I was editing. And it was just something I enjoyed so, so much because I'm incorporating all of the elements of art. You're using things like, you know, rhythm and and juxtaposition and, you know, contrast and all, all of these elements of art. But then you're also using the element of time right and you're capturing an audience and you're getting them to look at your work if you're good you know that's the idea is you want to attract <laughs> an audience <laughs> so it felt so um like empowering and also artistic and creative all at the same time and so i loved it so much i decided to take a summer class at usc and really just see what it was all about i'm like well thinking to myself if I enjoy this and I want to pursue this as a career, great. This is kind of the jumping off point. But worst case scenario, I'm going to bring all of these tools and skills that I've learned here and bring them back to my classroom and share with my students. Well, I loved it so much. And I took advantage of the fact that I was in Los Angeles and going to USC. I also did an internship at a music video um, post-production house. And so they were making music videos for people like Nelly Furtado at the time. And that fascinated me. So I pretty much just went ahead and left teaching at that point. <laughs> and I got a job as a dubber at Buna Murray. And so that was pretty much my like foot in the door to even like get in a production company or production house at all. And really reality TV wasn't something I even thought about. And it was still very new, like the real world was round, but it was one of the, you know, very early shows. I think Survivor may have like just come on the scene, but it was all very experimental and it wasn't really an established like genre like it is today. But I found it fascinating. And even dubbing like the tapes of the raw footage, like just watching the way these people behaved. I was working on a show called Love Cruise and it was like a dating matchup show where everyone was on a cruise and they just were behaving really badly. The show would probably do really well on Bravo if it were ever to come back. But Because <laughs> yeah, nothing wholesome <laughs> happens on a show called Love Cruise. Let's be honest. Right. No, no, no. It was just nothing but debauchery. <laughs> but, you know, the voyeur and me loved watching all of this footage. And then I loved watching how the editors put it all together and what they were able to make of it. And how, also how they would take, like, two hours of sailing where nothing would happen and turn it into a 30 second montage that became fun and entertaining. And I was like, wait, that's not what really happened. How did they make it look so fun? <laughs> I mean, those people were bored out of their minds waiting just to get to the next destination. So when I saw the power and creativity and what they were doing, that's when I wanted to dabble in it more. And so that's where I really learned how to edit was there at the at the real world and then I also worked on a show called making the band which was really fun because again I love music so much and then music was such a part of the show and they're learning their own choreography and they were writing their own music and so editing those scenes together was really fun too when you think about how much editing can affect you know not just an entire show but you know even specifically just a scene um you know the the, the concept of friction you know the the the, the goosebumps is inspired by music the you know the lifting of the back from the chair as it draws you into the screen how do you know as an editor if you're if you're f watching someone who doesn't know that you're watching them watching your show how do you know that you've done your job really well Oh, well, when I know I've done my job really well when I elicit any kind of reaction or emotion from someone who's watching my work. Like if I get if I make you angry, I've probably done my job because I'm probably working on a documentary and I want to get you angry about something. Right. <laughs> if I've made you cry, it's because you've watched this contestant's journey where she's a frontline COVID nurse. And now she is there uh, getting ready to compete on American Ninja Warrior to show America how tough she is. Like because she's just not tough enough in the, you know, in the hospital doing her daily job, you know. So hopefully I'll make you cry over over the obstacles she's come through to even be there and be able to compete. Um, you know, that's that's definitely when I know I've done my job. And, you know, what's funny is working at home, as we all are right now, so many of us are because of COVID, it's very isolating and it's very hard because it is, it's a very important part of my work to bring other people in 
to my edifice while we're in the process of making it and just scream, right? Let's, let's just screen and see how people react. And it feels so different when you watch your own work, when someone else is in the room and it's almost like everything's heightened so much more. So those, those long pauses where people are bored feel even longer. And you're like, Oh my gosh, I got to tighten that up. I got to edit that. Or, or if a joke doesn't land quite right and it just falls flat in the room, you really feel it, you know? So you're like madly taking notes, like, Oh, let me punch that up. Need a new reaction shot for that, you know? But yeah, you really, for me, it does help so much to have someone else in the room to experience it with them. How much do you rely on a tempo of a scene in order to kind of dictate the feel of it? Do, like if you're trying to elicit emotion, are you, are you purposely fast cutting? If you're trying to drag out a scene, you know, not, not for, you know, time sake, but for, you know, for emotional impact, do you find yourself switching the tempo based on the emotional response you want to elicit? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it, well, the thing is, as an editor, you're completely in charge of the timeline. And so you are completely in charge of the pacing. And so you do sometimes want to have people, you know, even talking over each other when they weren't really um, just to kind of show of a more of a frenetic kind of um, energy in the scene, because you might be ramping up to them having a big explosive moment. So you want to feel that a little bit more along the way. Um, or what I like to do is, uh, especially when you want someone to like pay attention to something that's been said, I'll just have like a moment of like pause or just quietness where someone just kind of looks where like they're taking it in for a second. Like we should be taking this in as the audience along with this person and then you come back with the line so yeah <laughs> <laughs> to, to draw a comparison uh to music genres as far as editing goes um do you find you know you're you're <clears throat> when you're editing you're 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 writing more of a not necessarily a love song, but definitely a song to hit the, you know, the emotions, or is it more like improvisational jazz where it's like, let, let's put it all in here, see what, see what hits, what doesn't, and then see where we have to change the notes. I would say it's much more like improvisational jazz, or I like to compare it more to um, carving David out of marble. <laughs> it's more like you just keep chipping away and chipping away and chipping away until it, it comes to life and it, it takes shape and takes form. I'm, I'm, I have an art background, I'm an artist, so that's why I, I tend to think of it more in art, art terms that way. When it comes to editing as well, um, I've, I've, I've personally always been of the mindset that it, does, that it doesn't hurt you know, when you're an editor to also be a musician, um, do you find having an art background actually helps you paint the palette when it comes to the whole scene? Having an art background helps me in a lot of ways, but mostly when it comes to things like graphic design and title design and, and timing of those elements, making sure the audience is able to read them cleanly clearly um so it's not cluttered you know I, I see some of my other editor friends struggle with that a little bit just because they don't have as much of an art background as i they have other strengths you know um you know yeah <laughs> so my art background definitely helps in that aspect um but you know i i just i feel like and you've probably noticed this as an editor as well we work with so many people that have a music background because I think music and having um, just an innate sense of pacing is so important to what we do. I work with several um, musicians. I mean, one of the best editors I know, he, uh, he's in a band called 180 True. It's a 182 tribute band, you know, Blink 182 tribute mm -hmm. band. And, um, but I think having music or at least a love of music, passion for music, having an innate sense of timing definitely helps what we do as well. One of the things I've always, you know, not necessarily rue, but definitely, you know, I've come to accept is that, you know, from, as opposed to when I, you know, before I was in television, um, I could watch TV and just kind of disconnect. And now I really can't not analyze everything from the edits to the camera work and all that. When you think back to, you know, the days when you were, uh, you know, a, a public school art teacher to now, do you find that the way you have watched TV and films has changed the more you edit different things? 
I look at TV and, and film um, completely different now that I've been working in the genre for, you know, 20 something years. Yeah, you can't help but notice, especially bad production work and, and just bad work. When things are good and it's working and it's flowing and I'm, I'm lost in the story, I don't notice it so much. Um, but yeah, I can't watch a reality show without like shouting at the TV, basically. <laughs> <laughs> With notes, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, how did they get away with that? Oh, no, you should have done that. Oh, you know, that was such a bad edit. Oh, why are they using that music cue? Oh, that's horrible. You know, or or what's even worse is like, because we work with so many of the same music libraries, <laughs> I'll recognize music cues that I've used for different scenes. And, you know, so that, that gets a little frustrating and, and annoying. And especially when you hear it in a commercial and it's like, wait, what? But they didn't have a budget? Like, that's the music cue they decided to use? You know. <laughs> I'm I'm going to say a sentence to you, and I want I want to get your very first initial visceral reaction to this when you hear someone say, "We'll fix it in post." Lazy with a capital <laughs> L. That's that's my very first visceral reaction. It's just someone's being lazy, or they're out of time, or you know you've got talent that just doesn't want to cooperate. Whatever the case may be, but my instinct first I hear lazy. But I mean I've worked enough on set to know that like things just kind of happen, and sometimes you don't have a choice but to fix it in post, and that keeps all of me, my friends, and myself, and you know employed. So. Maybe it's not such a bad thing. <laughs> How often are you actually on set when in seeing the production uh, as it's happening? And do you find that helps in the edit? Or do you find that, you know, by being there, you already have a mental picture and it, you know, it's hard to edit outside of that picture? Well, quite frankly, I am very rarely on set. <laughs> By the time I come on board, you know, everything's already wrapped and, you know, everything's in the can and, you know, the assistant editors have been spending a, a week or two getting all the footage grouped and organized and story producers have probably already started analyzing the footage as well. So I'm not on set very often. Uh, I was fortunate a few times to be able to go on set on American Ninja Warrior because they shoot, you know, right here at Universal in my backyard practically. So, you know, I was lucky enough to go. And honestly, that experience, um, it's really boring on set. It is so boring on set. And there's a lot of time in between runs and it just gets very repetitive. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised the audience is still applauding at four o'clock in the morning quite frankly. So <laughs> you start to sympathize a little with the fact that like when you're looking for good B-roll shots, you, you know, the audience looking enthusiastic, it's going to be harder to find the later in the day it is. And you kind of understand why after being there, you know, but in terms of how it makes me feel about the footage, the few times I've been there, it, um, you know, it's usually for reunion shows and things like that. So it's, uh, it just gives me something to look forward to cutting more than anything. And it just makes me more anxious to get started. <laughs> now, when we were talking before we started the interview, um, you had mentioned that you also spent some time as a radio DJ in LA. How was that? Well, actually I was a radio DJ in Texas. So, sorry, Texas. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Texas. Um, school in Huntsville at in local radio station was KSHU 90.5. It was part of the, uh, college campus. And I'm just so fortunate that I was even able to do that as an art student. Normally, you know, it'd be something for just communication students to be involved in, but they opened it up and I did the Thursday night, late night alternative music shift. And so it was just kind of fun and it was a really fun outlet. And thankfully, because I was able to stay in touch with um, that department and dabble a little, you know, it, it just, you kind of see how it all comes together now as an editor, you know, I'm, the same kind of techniques I was using to blend my music together and have one music cue, you know, flow into another as a DJ, I'm now doing in a different way, but as an editor with the music I'm using under my scenes. So that's applicable, you know, um, and I would want to create, you know, emotion and, and I would curate my shifts when I was a radio DJ, the same way that you curate music under what you're doing in your scene work as an editor. So it's very similar in that way. When you're sift, obviously, you know, we would mentioned uh, earlier 
um, about, you know, having a music supervisor on the production and they sometimes are the ones that pick the music. But when you're in a situation where, you know, you're sifting through, you know, whatever music library that the production is using at the time, how much does your personal music taste influence that what you're looking for? My own personal music taste probably weighs very heavily in the music choices that I end up making just because, um, you know, how can it not, you know, you, obviously you're going to pick something that's appropriate for the scene, but if it connects with you personally, then it's probably going to connect in the scene and, and help communicate that emotion, whatever it is you're trying to communicate. So I do tend to lean toward electronic music, especially because that just tends to be something I like, but it works on a lot of the shows that I work on. Like it, electronic music plays really well under RuPaul's Drag Race. We use it a lot. Um, I tend to use more orchestra music, but like big orchestra music when I work on American Ninja Warrior because the packages sometimes have these like kind of big Olympic feel to them. And, and I want you to really kind of feel the stature of how amazing this athlete is. So that's why that music's appropriate. But, you know, it's probably got a really good beat and probably you could dance to it, which is something I would want. So, yeah. (laughs) When it comes to, you know, certain genres or certain, uh, you know, styles of TV and films having certain, you know, almost being feeling pigeonholed as far as the the music choice, I I flash back to like when Star Wars, like the very first Star Wars came out. Most of the films at the time had a very disco based soundtrack because it was 1977 and every, everything was disco back then. And then all of a sudden here comes this movie with this big, you know, sweeping sprawling orchestral landscape. And it was just so out there. How important is it sometimes to kind of break out of genre pigeonholes when it comes to different types of series when you think about you know for first even for sports you know football you expect to hear that nfl films type you know uh you know the frozen tundra of lambeau field type music and then you know for hockey you expect to you know hear like almost like a, a very heavy crunchy guitar type sound do you is it important to almost break out of those genre pigeonholes I think it's very important to break out of those pigeonholes in terms of uh, the genre that's being used when you can, because when you do, then people really wake up and they notice because, you know, the audience kind of has a preset notion like we all do of of what you expect to hear behind an NFL, you know, (laughs) film, you know, there's like that jock rock kind of thing too, you know, maybe it's, it's that you're expecting. And then if you go in with something that's orchestral, people are kind of taken aback or, or they don't notice, you know, it surprises them or if you do, you know, like a country rock song where they're expecting something that's orchestral. They'll be like, whoa, that's unique. That's different. So I think it is really good to break genre when you can. However, genre does work because people like familiarity in a way. They like they like that familiar feeling that, you know, it's it's almost like, you know, cuddling up with your, your partner, you know, on the couch. It's like, you know, when you're going to watch the show, you expect, like, you know, Sex in the City, for example, had a very distinct soundtrack. Um, and a lot of the real housewife genre, they have tried to replicate that sound because they, it just, it's it's just that warm hug of what you expect when you're sitting there talking with your girlfriends that's what the music should be in the background kind of thing you know when was the last time as an editor that you watched something that you didn't work on that you know like you know the the hairs on the arm you know or on the back of the neck just stood right up and it had like a, a an almost an unexpected positive impact on you as a viewer oh hmm. Look, I get emotionally touched very easily when I watch a lot of programs on television. So even a whole makeover show will sometimes make me cry. (laughs) So I'm very happy for the family that's getting the makeover, you know, if it's their dream come true. Um, But in terms of something that just like made my hair stand up uh, with any kind of an emotional reaction, it's the Alan versus uh, Pharaoh a series right now i'm not going to say it's something that you know warmed my heart not in that way it's something that really made me angry and it made me emotional in a very different way but it was something that really kind of like definitely got a reaction out of me that um and then 
I mean, documentaries are really what's been like hitting me hard a lot lately. And I spend a lot of my time watching documentaries. Editing is often referred to as the invisible art. You know, the, the, the whole theory of the less you see the editor's work, the better the editor has done their job. How true is that statement? It's true and it's not true. I mean, look, it's, it's like anything. There's moments where it, 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 like you want to notice the editor's work. And for example, uh, I'll never forget the movie Train Spotting. When I first saw Train Spotting, I think that film in particular relied very heavily on the editing. And it was beautifully done, but you noticed it. It was like very abrupt, very, very cutty, like the whole film. But it worked. It absolutely worked. Um, so I think it's good when you notice the editing, you know, and there's like even even the classic film Woodstock, you know, the documentary where they created the three panels, you know, so you could see three different um, images at once, which was kind of, you know, very new at the time. But again, like you, it, you noticed it, you noticed this edit choice. Right. But it worked. It was, you know. Um, but then again, I think some of my most enjoyed moments are where you just kind of get lost in the movie when you get lost in the story and you just kind of escape and you're, you're there with the characters. And you just kind of mentally connect. You know? Scripted television versus reality television. Which do you think actually tells a personal story better? Take, take it, taking out the fact that of course the script is about a fictional character. Which do you think actually tells a character's story arc better? Well, tells a story arc better is probably a scripted project because you can have more of a scope of a person's life, right? You have more of a scope of a story arc. Whereas in a reality TV show, you know, we're probably honing in on a very specific part of their their time, their life, you know, uh, even if it's something like a Point Protection Alaska, you know, a life life below zero, those kinds of shows. It's a very particular point of time in their life. You know, there might be some flashbacks here and there, but you're still very limited, where I think with scripted, you're completely unlimited with what you can cover. Now, you still actually paint. I absolutely do. So, oh, yeah. So, so what do you paint? And uh, if I remember correctly, seen on your on your website that you actually had some of your uh, artwork at a at a an auto, an auto show recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last year I was uh, fortunate enough to be selected to be part of a gallery show uh, that was automotive themed, <laughs> which <laughs> is my current obsession. I've been painting a lot of car paintings, and um, you know, just kind of. Uh, Living here in Southern California and Los Angeles specifically, there's a lot of classic car collectors. And so these cars are just kind of like out on the streets and, and they're beautiful. You know, I grew up back east. I grew up in New York and New Jersey. And of course, the salt on the streets, you know, will rust out all these old cars. So you just don't see them as much. And the weather's just not as pleasant either. So you're not just out driving around your little thunder, you know, 55 Thunderbird, right? Whereas the weather here, you know, people are just out, you know, I'll even see Jay Leno driving his, his classic cars around town. So it's just so magical to me when you, when you see them and they're there. So I'll photograph them and I draw and paint from those photographs. And so that's been my latest obsession. Although right now I'm actually doing a painting of the Beverly, um, Beverly cinema, Quentin Tarantino's movie theater. Um, just cause I don't know. If I'll look cool. Now, painting right now i do some paintings from my own airbnb back in texas you know, there's all kinds of different things but yeah now when you're painting like what's the ambiance for you do you do you have to have like pure quiet or do you prefer to have music on while you're painting i love painting because that's when i'm listening to music <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you say that yes yeah, so typically i'll have my big Bose cans on big headphones and I kind of tune out the whole world and I'll uh, listen to some sort of uh, either some, some DJ that's on Twitch, which is my new obsession. I am obsessed with Twitch. I listen to Twitch day and night uh, or also Pandora because I've been curating a couple of channels on Pandora for you know, I don't know, 10 years now. So it's really honed into what I really like. Um, but yeah, that's the time for me to just kind of escape, listen to some music, just get in the zone and, and paint. 
I was about to say, like, you, you see a lot of, you know, creators really taking to Twitch right now. And and how much do you feel that, at least in the interim, is going to replace the idea of the live concert? Well, I don't think anyone could, anything could really replace the experience of a live concert. However, in the interim, because of COVID, because everything's been closed down, I mean, outlets like Twitch have been wonderful. I have recently rediscovered one of my favorite clubs through Twitch because they're not able to have their DJ, you know, do a show every Friday night. He does a show now on Twitch for donations to help keep the club alive and keep it thriving. And um, so I listen to more <laughs> club music and I'm dancing like every Friday night in my garage. We've thrown up some lights and just kind of converted it. And um yeah, it's just, it's been so much fun. It's been so fun. So in a way I'm participating in like a club environment more than I normally would in like real life just because of Twitch. So I hope that continues, you know, but I, we'll, we'll see. Now you were also nominated to the uh, MPEG board of directors, as I recall. Yes, I'm, I'm on the board of directors right now. This is my seventh year as a member on the board. So what does that entail? Well, a lot of really boring (laughs) day-to-day operations of of the Motion Picture Editors Guild. But um, most importantly, my work on the board is I help promote events. I help um, organize events. I help plan events. um, And I'm just there to really help help meet the needs of our members, too. So if they have any kind of problems on a job, if they have any kind of questions, um, I'm usually one of the first people to contact because in reality TV, there's only two of us right now who are on the board who have a reality TV background at all. Um, So I tend to be kind of a point person, a liaison in between the field reps that actually do like the real day-to-day work (laughs) of the guild and our membership. And you've also done a number of talks uh, promoting uh, women in post-production and, you know, LGBTQ plus like, you know, getting, you know, getting representation behind the scenes. How important is it for the playing field to be even behind the camera? When I left teaching and I first started working in the entertainment industry, I was shocked at how few women were in post-production. There were two that I knew of at, you know, at Buda Murray on the real world. And um, I just watched the two of those women in amazement and, and they were my mentors and my idols. And I just, and I couldn't believe that they were the only two. And I also couldn't believe how few people of color worked in post-production because I mean, it came from a public school environment where, you know, it was incredibly diverse and I was just so shocked at the lack of diversity. <laughs> I was also really shocked that, you know, even in liberal Los Angeles, South, you know, Southern California, there still weren't that many LGBTQ people who were around, um, you know, and they were having their issues. And so, you know, I just was like, this isn't right. And so I do try and do as much as I can to promote our members and help level the playing field wherever I can. I try to go back and speak at high schools, especially so that high school students can see that, look, if I can do it, you know, and look, I'm a former teacher, you know, it just takes a little drive and determination, but if I can do it, I know you can do it. To anyone who's interested in becoming an editor, you know, you think about, you know, broadcasting schools and production schools or film school, and most people that get in there either want to be an actor or a director. That's usually kind of like the the first go-tos. But for someone who finds themselves interested in the post-production process, what advice would you give to them? If you're interested in post-production, just like do it and do it now. And if that means partnering with someone who's like a, a, a YouTube content creator and they need someone to help cut their videos because they're starting to grow and they don't have time to do their own editing, that's a great way to get your foot in the door. I mean, just just do it and like practice working with a client, even if it's someone that's like that, you know. Um, my own husband who's transferred into becoming an editor as well, he started by working with this woman who creates a, a spice channel where she it was literally <laughs> just, she would do one video about pepper or one video about turmeric, or, you know, and they were really simple, educational, but also entertaining little videos. But it was 
was a way for him to practice working with the client and, and dealing with her needs and putting in the right music and what were the what's the notes process like, right? So that gives you a chance to experience all of that. And then you have material that you can show someone. You can say, well, look, I already do this for this channel. And, you know, the digital world is becoming so much more accepted that I really don't care who you've cut for. Like if, if you've cut a talk show already for this client who's got half a million subscribers on YouTube, sure, you can edit Red Table Talk and then just kind of go from there, you know? So it's, my advice is just like, just do it. <laughs> Get practice, nose of the grindstone, just start making content and do it. There are so many YouTube channels out there that are doing a lot of really good editing and, you know, these videos, they're basically like, you know, being seen around the world, you know, and when you think about, you know, you know, when you started working on, you know, shows like the real world, it's like, well, YouTube wasn't really there at the time, you know, so how much has that actually changed post-production over the years? I will say that um, jump cuts are way more accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to YouTube, um, you know, we could have jump cuts in the middle of an interview and I don't think people would care at this point, you know what I mean? Because people are already kind of doing that already on YouTube. However, you know, it's almost like, um, it's almost like a genre in that, like, I think we might look back, you know, 20 years and when you see that quick cut interview where you take all the air out, you'd be like, oh, that's so YouTube, like 2020, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think just because it kind of lends a style the same way that like TikTok has its own editing style and it has its own kind of unique feel and look just because of the way that you interact with the app, you know, and it's already kind of all built in and I mean, really, I think looking forward to the future, I think it's going to be much easier for anyone who's like a producer or a content creator to do their own editing and to create their own content that you don't necessarily need an editor. Like you could be a one man show. And I think software and everything's kind of moving more in that direction to make to make editing more accessible in general and easier in general. Okay, so Mary, we've come to the point of the podcast where we've come to the central question. So Mary, if you had to introduce yourself to a complete and total stranger, but instead of saying, hi, I'm Mary, this is what I've edited. Here's my mm -hmm. Emmy. Here's my Emmy, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Here's my Emmy, oh God. <laughs> um, you basically hand them a mixtape, and on that tape are songs that tell the story of you. So what songs are on that tape and why are those songs there? All right. Well, I've listened to your other podcasts, so I knew that this question was coming. I came prepared. <laughs> Notebook is ready. <laughs> Notebook is ready. Um, I'm going to start with um, kind of my early days and, you know, go in succession a little bit. But Generation X, the band that was uh, Billy Idol was in, they have a song called Ready, Steady, Go. Well, I am Generation X. I mean, I'm just, that's my generation. But that song in particular, just the energy, the rawness, just the youthfulness. He sounds so young. It's so unpolished. That to me represents my teen years for sure. <laughs> that along with um, suicidal tendencies. Oh. I, I have a very punk background. Uh, if you remember the song Institutionalized. I do very well. <sighs> I love that song. It, the song tells a whole story. And I just, I related so much to his, his being misunderstood by his parents, right? All he freaking wanted was a Pepsi. Like, <laughs> like all I wanted was a Pepsi, mom. And here you are. I need drugs. I'm just taking out my room and thought, like, leave me alone. That was very much my use. <laughs> Not that I needed to be institutionalized. Let's let's not mistake that. But um, or, okay. or, or needed a Pepsi so next, for that matter. <laughs> no, didn't need Pepsi. Uh -uh, no. All right. After that, I would probably put on their Wall of Voodoo Mexican Radio. Oh, such a good song. To me, that represents my my years at, uh, at KSHU ninety point five in Huntsville, Texas. I remember distinctly when that that album came out. I remember the first time I played that song. It was so quirky, unusual. I mean, to me, it just kind of summed up summed up the whole alternative music movement at the time. And then flash forward like fifteen years later, and my next door neighbor, when I moved into my first house in North Hollywood, California, is Chaz Gray, the keyboardist from Walla Voodoo. Oh, geez. 
I'm like, are you kidding me? This is my life. That this band I idolize. I used to play you on the radio. Now you're my next door neighbor. It, like, so it was kind of a crazy, you know, full circle moment. Um, oh, and I skipped over this one also is definitely very much part of my youth. Motley Crue from the album Too Fast for Love, the oh. very first single, Live Wire. Again, oh another, my gosh. Like I, I think people forget just how good those early Motley Crue albums actually were. It was so raw. When that when that that guitar kicks in, like they go so hard, so hot, so fast <laughs> that you know you are in for a ride with that song, right? Oh my gosh. And like glam metal, like I was very into rat and all those kind of bands. And and so Motley Crue, I think, really kind of like encapsulates the whole glam rock vibe. So it was very into back then. And I actually did get to see them and I shared a photo of you with you <laughs> from 1985 when I got to see them on the Theater of Pain tour. Oh my gosh, that was crazy. All right, so then moving forward, uh, I think a song that would really sum up my teaching years would be Selena, Bitty Bitty Bum Bum. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with Selena, but, um, you know, she, you know, because I taught in Texas and I had a lot of Hispanic students and we would listen to a lot of music in my classroom, you know, Selena was like the one person we could all agree to listen to and we all loved. And I just, she has such a distinct and beautiful voice and, um, that song just kind of encapsulates the whole time period of my life, I think. And then last, one last one, I think would be Pat Benatar, All Fired Up. Oh, another phenomenal singer. It's just one of those songs that, like, as soon as it comes on the radio, you want to sing along with it. It, it does get you fired up. And to me, that song symbolizes my years working in the Motion Picture Editors Guild and with the union and really working hard for equality amongst our members. You briefly touched on the fact that, you know, when you were starting out, you worked at a, you know, a company that was doing music videos. When you listen to a song, do you try to visualize what the video should look like? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I do. I absolutely do. And I, I mean, I have all kinds of fun fantasies going on in my head of what I, I actually thought I wanted to be a music video editor. Like when that's why I took the internship at that particular company um, and possibly move into music video directing because it's just so creative and, and you can create any kind of world and the budgets are outrageous, <laughs> or at least they were back then. Right. So you had so much money to play with and you had so much like visually you could do and experiment with. Um, and I forget where I was going with that, but <laughs> <laughs> so I do, I do have to ask, okay. Yeah. So if there was a song where there's not a video already done for it, so we have to take out Mexican radio from all voodoo here. There was already a video sure. for that one. Sure. Sure. But if there was a song that there is not a video already made for it, that you, if someone said, here's a bunch of money, you direct, you edit, go with it. What song would it be? Well, I mean, any great song I could already, I can think of already has a music video, but um, I think I'd probably want to remake Ministries, Every Day is Like Halloween. I think there's so much fun you could have with that. <laughs> <laughs> Visually, I think you could really have a lot of fun with that. I also really connect in terms of like the beat. And the energy, I love um, Front 242 Headhunter. Oh, wow. I love the actual original music video. It's just so abstract and so weird. And you're like, what What the heck? You still want to watch it? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I could really have fun making that over. So I don't know. That would be kind of like my fun fantasy world is if I could make over music videos from back in the day. <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for this. This has been such a great conversation. Um, where can we find you on social media? What are you working on next? And where can we see some of your paintings if that's actually out there to see? Yes, my paintings are out there to see. Uh, let's see, social media. I am Fight Mad Mary on Twitter. I am Deshambra Fine Art on um instagram i'm also yeah or you just search marriage to chambra 
to find my personal Instagram, which is quite public, actually. Um, and my next project that I'm getting ready to start next week, actually, is American Ninja Warrior Season 13. So I'm very excited to uh, have that be premiering this summer. And then you should also look for RuPaul's Drag Race All-Star Season 6. That will also be coming out this summer. So watch for both of those. Mary, Mary, thank you so much for this. This has been the Made You a Mixtape podcast. If you're listening to us on any audio streaming service, you can watch this entire video on YouTube. And if you're already watching this on YouTube, go ahead, download us. We're on Spotify. We're on iTunes. Tune in. iHeartRadio. We're pretty much all over the place. This has been the Made You a Mixtape podcast. I'm Jason. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Take care. Take care.